Welcome to the Mesa North Media Arts Center in South River. Uh, I'm Barry Copeland and I'm with Don Ritter and uh, we're live here in South River, Ontario. South River is a small village of a thousand people uh, that's located in uh, the meetings of Northern Ontario in Canada. And uh, thank you for uh, those of us who are watching us live at this moment. And uh, we'll also have this archive uh, for later experiences. And um, the occasion of our uh, time here together is uh, this installation called uh, O Telephone. So here we see uh, in the middle of the space is a, um, a phone that's um, uh, an old 1960s analog phone. And, um, uh, and we'll be, uh, it'll, it'll uh, make its appearance known at an appropriate time <laughs> uh, in, the, uh, in our presentation today. Uh, today is mainly a interview discussion, uh, kind of free-flowing discussion with, with Don about his work. And, um, uh, and, I'm, uh, and we'll try to uh, incorporate the chat as well. I'm just gonna look for the chat messages here um, and uh, see. So, um, yeah, so let's see. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, Don, this is, uh, you have a long history of making works with video and um, interactive video works. Uh, and uh, this work is uh, only an audio work. Yeah. And uh, it's not the first or only audio work you have, but uh, maybe um, uh, tell me the differences of working with and without video. What, what are some of the um, uh, opportunities that are there when, when uh, the video aspect is removed? Do you mean exhibition opportunities? Are you no, speaking I meant in a more general creative way? Uh, the creative uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, well, other, if I go back a long time ago when I was you know, primarily painting, there was no audio, but I don't think I've ever created a, a video-based work without audio. So audio has, has always been there. And actually my involvement with electronics really comes through audio. And if as, I don't know if you want that background, but you know, as, as a child, I was heavily into music, specifically record players. I think that was something particular about the 60s, that you know, the, the, the variety of media uh, technology that was available then was relatively small compared to what you have today. You had you know, newspapers, magazines, radio, television, and records, basically. But I started, um, you know, listening to you know, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and the Beatles. Really, at six, seven years old, and my first record player, I think, was I don't know, maybe around that time, eight or nine. It was a little suitcase um, with one knob, and I got it as a Christmas present. And after a couple of years, it's like this little speaker, you know, just didn't cut it anymore. And our television set black and white Westinghouse had a quite a large speaker. I'm imagining that it was 10 inch, but it was probably more like eight inch, so I, I removed it. And then a, another brother, no one asked me, where did you get this speaker from? Because <laughs> I didn't tell my mother, I replaced it with the speaker that was in the record player, which was probably three inch <laughs> or something. So, and then my brother made this, and then I had this you know, big, at the time I thought a big woofer, um, and then as the years went by, you know, by the time I was 16 or 17, I could be exaggerating, I'd say I probably had the best audio system in the city. <laughs> uh, 10,000 people, I had acoustic research speakers, I had at one point a Luxman amplifier, dual alternative, this was pretty 
high-end stuff. So that really, my involvement with with audio really comes at that stage. And maybe I'm giving you more details than you want, but on the visual side, I was also, I started oil painting at, at uh, I think about 17 years old, but as far as drawing and art, again, that also happened a really young age. I was, I, I remember grade three, I had copied a Henry Moore sculpture. So all the other kids were doing, you know, flowers and tur turtles and, and this abstract sculpture, which was of a mother holding a child, which I think was supposed to be Jesus and Christ. But in my case, it was, it was quite abstract. And, and then my teacher was quite surprised when she asked me, what is this? I said, well, it's a, I'm trying to copy a Henry Moore sculpture. And, and she said, well, how do you know about Henry Moore? Because I'm nine years old. I saw it in the library. So as the years went by, then um, I thought, okay, when I graduate from high school, I was going to study electronics engineering because I want to design audio equipment. Mm -hmm. That was because I was really quite fascinated. I loved listening to music. I tried playing guitar. I could play you know, all along the Watchtower uh, um, uh, version, Jimi Hendrix version not the Bob Dylan version. And then, um, and I'm still painting, but I wasn't, audio wasn't really, as far as my creative um, uh, production, there was no audio, it was basically painting. And then when I start, then when I was finished, I got hired by a telecommunications company and because then I learned there really isn't a lot of audio, you know, design of audio equipment in Canada other than speakers. And, and, but still, I wasn't really working in audio. It's only when I went back to university and, and, and was doing a fine arts degree, and there was one piece, I'm not sure exactly why, but it was, I had taken um, a tire, covered it with, <laughs> okay, um, okay, here's that installation, so this, some random, it's, it's a little finish on the side. Do you want to shut it down? No. Okay. Um, the piece, I, I took a tire and I paint, would paint it white and then I would roll it on canvas. And then I had the, uh, the tire tread on it and on pieces of canvas. I laid it around the room. And, and, but then I had a recording of car traffic. And that, I would say that really was my first audio-based installation, which ironic, as you know, my car piece later become the most well-known piece. Um, so I guess I was, that was the only, at that level of my mm -hmm. undergraduate, that was the only sort of sound-based piece I had created. And then you were listening to a lot of music. All the time. I had a very big record and, you know, by the time I was 16, I, already, I was already finished with Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and I was then, you know, okay, I'm going to go to Miles Davis and then I started listening to country music, but not, not Merle Haggard, more like, uh, you know, the Birds and the Flying Burrito Brothers, the sort of the hippie cowboys that, you know, were into lots of different, different things. So I had quite a wide selection and then when I went back to university, Bela Kuti, a friend of mine, actually, what, what is his name? Um, the guy he writes for music, Tim Perlick, mm -hmm. who I think wrote for music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Tim was my, my flatmate at University of Waterloo, and that's where he exposed me to Bela Kuti, and then I started, started getting into African music. So it was quite, my interest in music was quite broad, but uh, new music or sound installations, was, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something I was following until I did my graduate studies. And then I started, which is where, I hadn't really worked in video before. Well, it's not exactly true. I, I, I was a, was it, I forgot what the company was, you know, back in, in the early 80s, when cable television was popular, cities were required to have a, some uh, video production facility that was open to the public. And there was one in Brampton, which was where I was at the time. So uh, that's where I first got exposed to sort of professional uh, video equipment and, and was directing TV shows of, you know, people's 
showing how to water plants or something. And, and then I would direct to show, so I got exposed to mixers and things like that. Then when I did my graduate studies in Boston, that's where, oh, then I'm going to take video production courses. I had, uh, that was at MIT, and then I took uh, film history at, at Harvard. So I was really developing, I was sort of moving towards moving imagery and sound. Mm -hmm. And so, but I would say since that would have been like the fall of 1986, where my, I, I, that was sort of my first big video installation. I had inherited this uh, video projector that Namjoon Pike had left behind because he, he had worked at the center. No one wanted it because it didn't work, but I was able to repair it. And <laughs> once I did that, then it became Don's projector, right? <laughs> it was a pretty old projector, three big beams coming out of it. And, um, and then the sound, I guess that piece, I did the sound and then I mean, I, I recognize that my music, you know, one thing listening to music is quite another making music. So then I had other students around me that uh, um, I was, you know, would, would sort of do the music and then I would do the, the sound effects and then encountered a guy named Thomas DiMuzio who wasn't actually at the university. I forgot exactly how I connected with him and so he had really advanced you know, knowledge, and he was heavily into like electronic music, and and what I, I discovered, at least my perception, was that when we have a visual experience, whether that is art or whether it's you know looking out the window, our comprehension is sort of much more, I would say, logical. Like if I look out the window now, the logic is I can see the sun is coming down, I can see across the street. But music, and I would say sound in general, has much more capacity to, to induce an emotional feeling. Mm -hmm. That was my, my perspective of it. Mm -hmm. But so since then, well, there was an exception. When I lived in Hong Kong, I did prints or metal with no sound. If I think about it, every one of my projects since then, has mu not necessarily music, sometimes music, but always audio, sound effects. I really enjoy, you know, doing doing sound effects in a way that it, it appears that the object is creating the sound, and in most cases, it's not, because sometimes when I'm shooting, like water or fire for whatever reason, I'm not recording the audio, and then I have to add it. So I think I became uh, I really spent a lot of time, uh, you know, writing about the different, what I call, uh, sound image relationships. And in my teaching as well, that's one thing that, that, that I emphasize. So I would say the introduction of sound into my work added um, an emotional impact. And, and many years ago, I wrote, an, I think, my first published article, which was in Music Works. And it was called Interactive Video as a Way of Life. <laughs> um, it, was, it was all about how that when you experience something interactive, that um, it almost seems alive. And in general, I mean, the nice example I like to give is, you know, when people go to a music performance, let's say a rock and roll is cheering and clapping, you can see the crowd has been pushed to this emotional level. Can you imagine going into a museum and looking at a Rembrandt going, oh yeah, great. people would think you were crazy, right? <laughs> but why can you do it in front of music? And that really became to interest me. So, so that's, you know, that's what I like about adding audio or adding music to, to a video work is it adds this um, emotional uh, impact, which is, I guess there's still an emotional impact to, to visuals, but Again, if you're screaming, oh, this is such a great photograph, people think you're nuts. Right? Um, but the history of when I, I guess, you know, when I was a grad student there, I had developed this piece of software where music would control video. And, and then, you know, one of my, I'll say, sugar daddies was, well, I should say sugar daddy, was Kenneth Council. 
and and mostly I was you know writing the software about video being controlled, um, and at that time you know even like a, like a you know one gigabyte disk drive was really quite expensive, and video projectors well not even possible for me to buy a projector, and I think I got two or three Canada Council grants in a row. This is coming back to to your question, <laughs> um, and. And then I didn't get it one year. And I thought, gee, well, I'll do a sound piece. And, and um, that's the history. And that, that piece, I don't know if you want me to, maybe I can explain it later, called Intersection, what people usually call a Don's car piece, but it became my most widely exhibited installation. Really quite ironic. And, and, and it became so popular to the degree when people would see you know, my video base say, oh, you're now expanding into visuals. Like, well, actually, it's the opposite. Right, yeah. Well, I, I can't say it's the opposite because if I look at my history, they were happening. They, they were happening. Yeah, they were part of it, but yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there um, something about time that's different in a piece that has no visual? The experience of time for the... Is, is the time, do I view time like differently? Right? Yeah, like do you manage time differently as the, as the author of the experience? Um, well, I guess, I guess in the case of, of visuals, um, you can have, I guess, what I would call an action. You're raising your right hand, you're raising your left hand. It starts here and it ends there. I guess music or a note or sound has a beginning and an end, but we don't really view it as an action. We view it as as um, a sound of of of, of, a, of of a certain duration. I never really thought about that, um, but the what I did find is that um, you know if you're going to have a, a, an environment of video and sound that is uh, synchronized with each other, and it's I have to sort of fabricate it in a way. Well, which has dominance? Do I have the audio and do I then edit the video to it? Or do I have the video and I edit the audio to it? Which one is in control is maybe not the right word, but which one, you know, which one comes first? Mm -hmm. And I find having, I think, <laughs> having the audio first was maybe better than having the video first. I think it's much more difficult to edit audio to video than video than video to audio. Um, of course, the way I'm Does doing the audio it, gives you the emotional temperature or can it do it? Well, if, it, if it's, you know, if I'm working with a musician and say, hey, did you mind if I, you know, if I take this part and move it to the front, it would completely make a different composition. But in the case of a video, like at the very beginning, a lot of it would be more of, a, I guess, what I, I would call a montage, which is, you know, video is just, you know, they're really fast and you can jump or now it's a hand, now it's a person's head. You can get by with that. If you do it, if you do it with sound and music, it's really quite chaotic. And, and, and I mean, that can be desirable, but I find, I find that you have much more leeway, you know, taking the audio, video and chopping it up and everything you do with especially if it's music. If it's sound effect, well, then you've got a little more leeway, but the sound, you know, what I like is you know, when you clap your hands, when the hands are together, you hear that sound. I really like synchronized sound, and that's the software I developed. That's what it did. That's what it did automatically. But I don't, I guess I, I in many ways, I, I sort of merge them together. Um, and, but again, I. Never created. I've never created a video-based piece without audio. Although I've created audio-based works without video. Is there, um, you know, the artists of the generations to come in the future? Will there be really no distinction that that they'll be as versed in audio as in video? Um, well, well I think that yeah, yeah. Well, generation? I think my perspective is well on many things is. It's a common word of these days. It's much more inclusive. Um, I know when, when I work with 
some musicians in the past, like one in particular, was there was in, uh, I don't want to give too many details, but my plan, it was quite a large group of people involved in this project. I had about, I remember, I think three composers, uh, six musicians, and then myself doing video. And then I brought in a couple of assistants. And in my plan, we're going to have three big video projections. And then the musicians are going to be in front of it. And then one of the main people said, no, 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 only monitors. We don't want to um, distract the audience from listening to music with big projections. And I thought, that's crazy. What do you mean? It's a completely different medium. And finally, I got my way because the other person said, no, if no one wants big projections. Now, a big stage, the person is saying three little video monitors. Well, that's, it's like, the, what is the, uh, this is Spinal Tap, you know, that <laughs> film where the guy makes the mistake and this, uh, the uh, uh, Stonehenge things comes by and I think he wanted it to be 19 feet and it comes down at 19 inches. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that would be absurd. Um, and, and so I have encountered that quite a few times, that musicians really hating visuals because they think it will distract, and that's completely wrong. Yeah, although I've, I have um, heard like um, other artists doing video and audio together that they had to increase the volume of the music a lot more than they would in a co regular concert without the visuals, because in order to mm. compete with the visual space. And, I found that. Uh, so visual yeah, space, yeah. especially in a big projection, yeah. it has a, a I don't know, a bigger presence, I guess, in the mind, and yeah, and uh, yeah, um, and I guess if it's uh, you know, chamber music or something is in the realm of, of what is just yeah. produced from yeah. a body yeah. of people, there's different scales, I guess, uh, of um, experience there, and uh, so maybe that was the instinct to shrink the video, but um, yeah, I, I don't know, I wasn't there, but uh, I, I, um, I, I. But I, I, I see that with, um, uh, you know, in our past shows that we've done that, that had videos and sound, but it's the, um, mm -hmm. uh, also the um, aspect of sound coming from, if, the, if it's just a visual front projection of having sound mainly in the front, mm -hmm. um, that you can't sort of move it to the back or the sides, it, it seems out of place. Um, yeah. That even if you have yeah. sound coming from multiple directions, yeah. still yeah. the front is the strongest. Yeah. Well, my experience is that it, it, it's, it, it's a compositional decision rather mm -hmm. than it being a rule. Um, because some of my pieces I want loud, and, and one of the most recent ones I did, which has it's sort of it's, it's slow moving mud and water, I found it was nicer with the sound actually quite low. Um, but, you know, especially, you know, my car piece, that's really loud. So for me, it's it's more of a it's more of a compositional decision than, than a rule based thing. Because again, I think one reason is because of my interest and background in audio and visuals. I, I don't I don't view them as competing at all mm -hmm. because they are doing different things. Like in this case, your your logic is oh I'm looking at flowing mud, right? But then when you put some crackling sounds, and it gives it to an emotional feeling. So for me, there's I I don't distinguish the importance between them because they are they're completely different uh, perceptual experiences that can augment and again once they're synchronized then it comes to light mm -hmm. you know when you clap your hands you know if I clap my hands and there's no sound it's like well that's strange and it seems like surrealism or something yeah uh, well let's talk about old telephones just to um, and also we were mentioning your background but you also did some work with the in, in, in uh, telecommunications and that and yeah and then yeah. you uh, you had yeah. also told me um, uh, privately that you were you know you had a lot of um, experience and enjoyment from yoga and yeah how yeah. how did um, yeah, yeah yeah these uh, these how did this how did this piece uh, bring yeah. those two interests together yeah yeah and in which is largely although we see the the telephone but. Um, we also uh, are mainly an auditory experience. 
This piece, yeah. Um, well, I guess, yeah, I got hired by, actually when I finished studying engineering and they moved me to Toronto, I, I guess I can say in Northern Telecom, which eventually became a company called Nortel, and, and that was at the time the largest telecom company in the world. But I, I actually never worked on a telephone because the, the, the main part of a telephone system is something called a switch, which can be a $20 million box. And the one I was working on really was the biggest that you could connect 100,000 telephones to it. And it's a, a, a total of about $20 million, depending on which features they wanted on it. Um, so I guess I, I, I learned quite a bit about the telephone system. Ironically, all of my formal art education really was funded by this company, either through my uh, salary or when I did my graduate studies, they gave me, they covered the whole expense and it was at American University of Edmonton, which was, which was quite, quite um, expensive. Um, but now to jump ahead many years, I guess it's been now about 23 years that I do yoga quite quite regularly and and the the with most yoga classes you begin with om and you end with end with om um, and and during some of those classes especially if it's uh, mostly women it sounds just fantastic in general my om and men's om you know it's sort of like a goat drowning in the river. It's not, I guess it's emotional, but it, it doesn't seem to work. And, and then, truthfully, I don't know where the idea came from, um, but I thought I would do something with OM. I don't really know where the telephone came from. I have, I have no memory of how that, that connection was made, but by, this would be, think about this um, maybe around 2000 it could be a little, a little earlier I'm not really sure that uh, I sort of had the idea of the telephone and by then I was living in Brooklyn in New York and um, and then I started getting the, these phones and people would tell me hey Don there's there's some junk store you know in Williamsburg and I saw two of them, so I would dash over, and some of them would be in bad shape. So it took me a couple of years, actually, because I wanted the black ones. Well, I wanted them all the same color. Mm -hmm. And I think back then they were grossly black or green. You know? um, and then eventually uh, I got them. And, and then I, uh, yeah, you know, this piece has been in production for almost 20 years, I would say. And then when it's only, I, I, I did not finish it in New York, but I did all the recordings and they were my yoga buddies. They were, they were, there's one male um, who was the yoga instructor. His, his own was very, it was a really good own. It should be, he, he's an instructor. Um, my own, I recorded, it, it didn't make the cut. It made, <laughs> yeah, it didn't make it. Um, and a few others didn't make it as well. Again, because some of them sound quite nice. The goal was to make something that was really quite uh, pleasant sounding, which is in complete opposition to intersection. Um, a lot of my pieces are somewhat aggressive. I didn't want to create this impression that I was obsessed with you know, aggression or anger because it's like that, that's not true. Um, so, and then I moved, what year that would be, 2000 and Six, and then I moved to Berlin, and then that was the first piece I started working on in Berlin. And then I um, uh, had to modify the telephones. In this case, I, uh, you know, the, the the speaker which is in the headset is pretty low quality by today's standards. So I found some sort of pretty good ones. It's as as good of a speaker you can get. That's this big. Um, and then the idea though of putting. Of, of, I didn't mention removing uh, the dial. These are all dial based because this model, mm -hmm. uh, historically, this is called the 500 set, which is the most popular design ever made 
in telecommunications. I think it came from a company called Western Electric. And, 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 and then other companies could probably buy whatever, but the rights to produce the same, the same shape. And, um, and then I was able to find speakers that fit. I remember walking down Canal Street in Manhattan, you know, going from store to store and these, these vendors thought it was price. I said, it has to be exactly this size and it has to look cool. And, and then I, and then I found them. And then in, um, and then I, I basically, then I wrote the software for it. And I don't know at what point you want me to go into detail. And then the first exhibition was in 2007 in, in Berlin. And, and then, then uh, and, and what was interesting about that is, is everything okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. What was interesting about that is that there, there seemed to be a different type of response by men or women that the, the men would, you know, pick up the phone, yeah, it's interactive, and they would leave within like 30 seconds. <laughs> It's got a psychic connection. If you pick it up, though, it's going to be even worse. Uh, oh, actually, pick it up and put it back down again? Okay, oh, there we go. Okay. We just listened to that for a bit? Okay.
was good good timing. So maybe I'll just explain in, in detail. Um, well, there's actually the, the configuration here is a little different than than the previous version. The the initial version actually let me finish one thing. The problem with the exhibitions from the initial version is that the audience, I guess, were poking the speaker. We think it was because they didn't believe the sound was coming. And as the weeks went on, they basically would destroy the speakers. And, and, and the speaker in the phone. The speaker in the phone, right, right. This is, this is nor normally the initial, there are only, there were six phones and well, I guess there's 12 speakers, a little speaker in the handset and there's a speaker in the phone. But I was quite surprised uh, that they were damaged. And the second time it was, that would have been in, uh, um, I guess that was in the Czech Republic in Brno. And I told the curators, I said, I want to put a grill over top of it because people are punching them out. And he said, oh, the Czechs, you know, they're very well behaved. And, and at the opening, within 30 minutes, someone had punched out, you know, the, the dust cap, I guess. <laughs> And then, and then I said, okay, now you're going to have to pay me some money. And then I think three of them got damaged. And then the third thing in France, they said the same thing. Oh, the, the French, they're very well behaved. Well, it was the same thing there. And, and they were really ripped apart by the time I came, I came out of that show. So that was back in 2009. So this, what is different, one of the things that's different is the first time it's been shown with um, the grill on top. Um, and initially I didn't like it, but now, you know, the, the alternative, you know, is I don't want to keep replacing it. So the initial, uh, how the initial uh, uh, version worked is that the phones would ring randomly. And if, if you would pick up the phone. The, the original version had six phones. This is one phone. Here. Right. I'm talking about the first version first. Yeah. Um, the first, uh, actually, if you just picked it up and it wasn't ringing, you got dial tone. And then if you picked it up when it was ringing, then a voice would play ohm coming out of that phone. And it would do that until you put the phone, the handset back down. Now, if one of the phones is activated and then another phone rings and someone picks it up, you know, now two ohms, but they, then they pan between each other. Um, and then if a third one gets picked up and then it pans between the three and four until eventually you have this, these six ohms going around you. Um, was there anything else? Then, as if you then would put hang up the phone, let's say six of them were panning, then it would it would dynamically switch to five, and it would just dynamically move. And it took quite a bit of programming to get it to do that smoothly, but it seemed to it seemed to have worked. Um, but this version, we tried something different. In this case, I decided to rewrite the software simply because of the operating system and the version of programming it was, you know, I, I thought to do it. So this is, is it doesn't have the six phones, um, uh, but what it does have is a much higher quality audio because, you know, you've got these good Genelec speakers here. So the way this system works, um, same thing, if you pick up the phone, you get dial tone. In this case, the dial tone will only come out of that phone. Now, um, if you, right now it picks a random pause between five and 20 seconds, and then it rings. And if, and if you pick it up, then you get ohm. And in this case, since we don't have multiple phones, what I did was after a certain amount of time, um, I think initially 20 seconds, then a second voice. So the first voice is now panning through the six speakers and then 20 seconds, another voice starts panning. If you hang up the phone, it doesn't stop immediately, it sort of fades out. It, it sort of depends on the amount of time, but the longer you hold it, that these new voices until, if I remember, it's about 240 seconds, I think that the six voices, and then you have all these six voices some are going around you clockwise, some are going counterclockwise, and some are moving sort of randomly between them. And then it, um, I guess, at 300 seconds, then it sort of fades out. Now, um, the other option... Which is about five minutes. Hmm? At about five minutes. Yeah, approximately. So 300 seconds is, is, is five minutes. 
Um, so if though, right now we've got a set between five and 20 seconds to ring, um, a new thing is that if you pick it up, you get dial tone, but you put it back down and in two seconds it starts ringing again. So that's what, that's, and I sort of like that feature um, with it. Um, and did I miss so something? Right, right now the phone is off. Yeah, right now the phone is off. Now it's finished, it's 300. Well, in this case, um, it starts fading out at 300 seconds and I think it can go up to about 40 seconds because it sort of depends where it is in what I call the sequence. Because when you, these six voices um, are combined in different ways. There's a pro, I think, let me see, I think 70 different recordings of people saying Om. Um, but when, it, when you pick it up, there's different combinations of those voices. So I guess it's almost different constantly. And what I've done is, is when it activates what I call a group, um, some of the voices are actually random. You know, some of them say, okay, the first voice is gonna be voice number eight and voice number 10, but now it's gonna be the first voice, it's gonna be a voice between number one and 10. In this case, by these numbers, I mean, well, which voice, you know, each, each voice is numbered. But if you, if you take it off, um, I mean, you can be holding it to your ear or you can set it down, which is what, what we have done. And now it's just sort of in this quiet state. So if I put it back again, now it goes back to this mode. So now the, the software has, has picked up, um, it's gonna pick a random number of minutes between five and 20 before it rings again. Or I think if I go like this, Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to let it, it's going to ring, it only ring four times. Is that okay, like that? Um, so can I answer it, or do you want to I don't know, well, let's, let's no, okay. so in this case, I'm not going to answer it, and, but so now it's selected another random number. Right, and already, we don't know what it is. I've already to, chose to listen. It's between five and 20, so <laughs> there's quite a bit of randomness in it, but that's what makes it sort of unique. What about, what, what about this aspect of the, of, of um, the, you know, the agency you're giving to the visitor for whether the piece plays yeah. or not? Like whether we hear the choir of, of Omni, uh, you know, is it really up to the people there? Because they could, we could ignore the phone. And you could ignore the phone. Play. You could ignore the um, phone, yeah. And I was just interested in that relation. And the thing about, and the, and the phone, like the, the party line, you know, from way yeah. back, like yeah, yeah. places like here, yeah. the, you know, yeah. we had that for a long time. So yeah. What, yeah. Uh, this aspect of these, you know, yeah. you pick up the phone, you hear other people talking in this case. Yeah, yeah. You hear this, uh, yeah. uh, these people yeah. moaning. Well, the phone is being used, I would say, in a symbolic way. It's not necessarily because I involve, because I never really designed a telephone, I designed switches. The, the phone for me is, is there's something, uh, it, it's about being called, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Because, you know, the, the word own, um, maybe some, some people know that, I mean, it really comes from uh, Hinduism. It goes back a few thousand years, and it, it basically uh, re rep, it knows to represent the universe uh, represents consciousness, represents awareness. So this is like really heavy, really heavy symbolism. So it's it's not it's not a sound that um, uh, that you can deal with lightly. So I, I'm certainly I, I am not a scholar of Om, and in a way I don't want to talk because I guess I'm not really qualified to to talk about it. Well, you but, can say what it means to you. But there there is I, I sort of like the sound. You know, because I've heard Om, you know, I've done, I go to yoga quite a bit, thousands and thousands of times, and, and it is quite, it can be a pleasant sound. And apparently there is some research saying that it actually is healthy for you, that it puts, it's sort of like meditation. You know, when, you, when you're doing Om, you can't really think of, oh, I have to buy groceries after work today. You sort of, especially when a group of people are doing it, and they're found that it's that sort of therapeutic, like, like, like meditation does um, do it. But in my case, what I liked about the symbolism, now I'm not sure if it was something I did purposely or accidental. It's like you're being called by the universe. 
right? Sort of like an idea, I mean, but I don't want to sound, you know, because that could sound a bit sort of flaky in a way, but... Well, but the phone is often used in cinema and poetry and many art forms yeah, to yeah. signify this connection yeah. to, yeah, yeah. to um, something that's not there in the room with you, yeah. that suddenly entered, yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, even yeah. can be, uh, yeah. in a poetic way, a voice yeah. of, the, uh, uh, of someone who's no longer there. I guess I like that better. Now, this you might not believe what I'm going to say is that when I did this piece, I had no recollection that I used to, dis, you know, be involved in telecommunications design. That's not <laughs> that's not why I did it. And ironically, when I looked the other day, and I look on here, it actually is a Northern Telecom phone, which is strange coincidence because the other six I have, none of them are Northern Telecom. So the fact that this one is a Northern Telecom is a, is a really strange, really strange coincidence. And I didn't even, in Montreal, I didn't notice that. I only noticed it here mm -hmm. um, because on the handset, the handset is for Western Electric. Oh, yeah. um, so because when I bought these, sometimes the handset would be broken and sometimes oh. the body would be broken. So th they were pieced nice. together yeah. um, uh, on it. But uh, uh, yeah, what else? What else? Um, well, I mean, I, I'm also trying to picture uh, you're in a yoga studio doing yoga class and starting with the Om and hearing this chorus of voices and, yeah. and is the playback of it among just the six speakers here anything like that? Well, or the difference is, you know, the, my classes, depending on the day, there can be up to 35 people. So the sound is coming from every direction, especially if, you know, you're sitting you're sitting in the middle, it doesn't really move, but I sort of, I'm not sure why I started, you know, the movie. Well, actually, I think I know why, because in, maybe I should describe intersection. So intersection is, is um, usually about a, about a 15 by maybe 12 meter room, completely dark, it's an eight channel sound system, um, and, and there are basically four pairs and the speakers face each other. And then it's like, it's basically like four lanes of traffic is what it is. And when the visitor walks into the room and the room really has light lock doors, so it really is black. And then you see at the English version, you see an exit sign, dimly lit exit sign. And, and in this case, these are your instructions. This is how you use the piece. What do you do with an exit sign? You walk towards it. So the cars are coming in and the sound is moving from one speaker to another to create the illusion that the car is moving across the space. And like this one, went randomly. So car goes across then selects a random number, I think between, if I remember, between three and maybe 20 seconds till the next car comes. Each lane is an independent system, so it can be complete silence, or you can have four cars, <laughs> they shoot across the screen. Now, if you stand in front of a car, when it's coming, and, and the way it's, I've adjusted it, it still comes until, it's, it sounds like it's almost in front of you, and then it screeches to a halt. And then you hear it idling in front of you. This is why we usually have like <clears throat> in a, at least 12 inch speaker, so we have a good, good rumbling sound coming out of it. And then uh, if you would then leave, and then you hear the car sort of start accelerating slowly, moves across the room. If you remain standing after the car stops, then subsequent cars come, they smash into that car. So <laughs> nobody, nobody knows this. And, and um, each lane is so independent. So traffic, you cause a crash. That's right, that's right. <laughs> and each lane can be independent. Now, again, this piece was created because that particular year I did not get a Canada Council grant and I thought it's going to be less expensive for me to make a sound installation. And, and, um, but actually, in a way, it's one of your more elaborate pieces. It's only, a, a, or you mean expensive? Well, only from the exhibitor's perspective <laughs> because I don't provide the sound system. I did um, basically, uh, back then it was an Amiga computer, uh, eight channels, a uh, Roland sampler, and then um, uh, infrared sensors. And then I had to design um, an interface, so how, do the, how do the sensors 
talk to the computer. So from my perspective, it's sort of less expensive than, than, um, uh, uh, than a video-based piece. Less expensive in the sense of what it takes to generate the content? I don't need a very powerful computer to do that, mm -hmm. right? When, right? These days when I'm working with, you know, 6K and, and stuff like that, or, or uh, back then, you know, if you wanted good graphics, it was really quite expensive. It was really the computer. So that that meant by expensive, you had to acquire the equipment or you had to go to places to work that had the equipment? Well, in this case, I, you know, I need to have the equipment in my studio. So I sort of need to own it because, I mean, something like this piece I've been working on for almost 20 years and it's gone through, well, this is, well, the previous computer, that was a 2000 and, Four, I think uh, Mac Mini, that was that was uh, accommodating it, um, but I think you know. So that's you know your question. That's where I sort of got interested in sound moving um, across the room. Then at that time, I knew I knew people at uh, the sound engineering uh, department at McGill, and I, you know they were giving me some suggestions. They told me because I didn't. I'd seen friends using samplers, but I didn't really pay attention. They said the sampler is the way to go because at that time, like an eight channel audio card, this was 1993, um, I don't think existed mm -hmm. back then. Right? You know? For intersection, you, uh, in order to do intersection, you had to use a sampler. That was, yeah, I got it. But, and also because, you know, even then this box, which was quite expensive, uh, could only hold, what was it? 20 seconds of audio or something like that. And how did I create all these lanes? I had the same sample, but I played at different speeds. So it sounds like this is a different car go, go, going slower. Because often, you know, I have to, you know, how can I, how can I do this? And, and it's one thing when I, when I worked <coughs> after, you know, designing the uh, uh, telecommunications equipment, I eventually was being hired by uh, Northern Telecom's R&D company, which was called Bell Northern Research, and they were doing really high-end, you know, in this case, human interface design. So that's where I ended up with a group of psychologists, and I guess they seemed to like me because I was coming out with wacky ideas, but that's exactly what they were looking for. They were looking for something that, you know, people weren't uh, developing, because when I first started doing the... Um, uh, you know, video being controlled by music people. Why would you do something like that? This is before Max and the Speed. This is for all of these other programming language that now do it. And and it was the thing is when you come up with a new idea, usually most people don't like it. They don't they don't actually recognize. It. And that's something that you know, as an academic, I really investigated innovation. I found this is popular all over. And I was talking to individuals who specialize, these are consultants for innovation. And they told me the biggest bottleneck that these high-tech companies have is they really don't want to be innovative. Because if you put a lot of money into creating a new idea, you don't really know if you're going to get anything out of it. You know, And it's just like, you know, I remember when the Macintosh came out, and I'm living in Boston, uh, you know, doing my graduate studies, and there were people, oh, you know, icons, pull them in, it's for children, you know, the real people, they type the command like MS-DOS. Yeah, well, who does that today, right? <laughs> right? Because this was innovative, mm -hmm. you know, using the icons, but most people don't recognize it. And back then, people, like, I think when I graduated, then I was a professor at, and I had this system, people from computer science, like, why would you want to do anything like this? Because they, they sort of look at technology in one particular way, and the things, the art stuff I'm looking, they say, well, you know, this is, what's, what's the purpose of, of doing that? But the approach, I went on a tangent, but the approach, one thing I learned from, especially from Bell Northern Research, was the difference between coming up with an idea for an electronic device is quite different than actually designing an electronic device. Like it's one thing, you know, you know, designing a new telephone, but it's another designing the first telephone because you have to come up with the idea. And the history we were talking last night, 
the history of the telephone is very, very interesting um, because for, apparently for the first 30 years, it was not very popular because no one, why would we want something? Why would I want to talk to my neighbor, my, my cousin on, in another city? Can you, <laughs> amazing, a amazing, amazing. There's a yeah, psychic connection. Well, actually, I would just let it because that otherwise we're going to get the ohm. Yeah, that's okay. We're going to get the ohm coming out of it. Oh, yeah, um, but, um, but I mean, the, this aspect of uh, the, this phone ringing, and then immediately I have this instinct to go and grab it. And um, so, in a way, the, you're, you're creating an interface that uh, invites participation. In this case, and I want to know if that is a common element. Uh, it's it's actually it's yeah. very interesting. I, I never noticed it, but what but, you but, but one has to think about how does yeah, one get engaged yeah, in yeah. it because interactivity yeah. is not necessarily the first thing we think about when we go to see yeah, artwork. Yeah, yeah, uh, We think of ourselves as passive. Well, uh, what a few people. But, but this this phone is like yeah, yeah. drives me to to participate. Well, what a few people have accused me of is doing psychology experiments with the audience and I do have a degree in psychology and I did <laughs> do psych real psychology experiments and and that um, and and I guess this one is like that as well the one that most people talk about is um, it's a piece called Vox Populi and I think that was 2004 where there's a very large video projection of a crowd of people and they're all clapping and going speech, speech. And in front is a lectern with a microphone and a video monitor with a speech. There's no the speeches are not titled, but they're by Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, like Ich bin ein Berliner, I have a dream. And, and depending on the country that it gets exhibited, in, I would select a famous speech. When you, so this, this is why it's more like an experiment. It's like, okay, you're being asked to be a leader and some people do it because everyone in the audience, they're sort of looking around, who's gonna, they can tell because the crowd, this is what I do in a lot of my pieces. I don't have any inst printed instructions. The piece tells you what to do. So the people are going speech, speech. Well, they're telling you to give a speech. So someone eventually goes up and then I start reading it. It's a, it's a voice control teleprompter. Um, and then the software I wrote is actually determining your level of confidence. So if you are not very confident, um, the crowd will start booing you. If you're confident, they start clapping and then you can go through different levels until they're just going crazy because you know, you're the new John F. Kennedy or, or something like that. So there is quite a psychological aspect to it. And my, my degree is actually in social psychology, which is you know, how, how people behave in, in, in social situations. That's sort of related. Um, I, I tend not to think about that, but it seems to just happen. It seems to happen naturally. And, and I, I think, you know, me ending up doing this type of work was not the direction that I had expected. I didn't really study engineering and work in telecommunication because that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to fund my art education because I knew as a painter that it was you know going to be sort of going to be <laughs> difficult. But then and then when um, you know my last my last semester in Boston where I started working with George Lewis, who's a pretty well known you know musician from New York, and then the door swung open suddenly I'm showing in Europe and suddenly in Asia and it just and that's actually why I went into electronics because well this is you know this is this is the path that I guess I'm supposed to follow I mean I never exhibited any painting outside of Ontario I mean, I've sold quite a few <laughs> well uh, with, with things like Vox Populi in a, in a completely different way this piece um, that they're kind of creating a Theater. Definitely, uh, yeah, yeah, so people, yeah, that's right. That's an element that, that you're um, uh, aware of. Is that part of the rules of making the piece? Is how does this function yeah, yeah, yeah. in a theatrical way? I, I guess it's human behavior. I mean, I mean, I mean, if you're. Is there a line there between theater and psychology? 
again, I sort of just merge them together. I, I, don't, I don't try to, to distinguish them in, in a certain way, but I, I, am, uh, I am really an observer of human behavior. When I write, that's often what I'm writing about, and, and particularly the relationship between ethics and aesthetics, which some people say there's no relationship. Well, my most widely cited paper is called the Ethics of Aesthetics, because, you know, if you look at a lot of, in this case, theater is something I'm not extremely familiar with. I'm much more familiar with narrative film. There's some relationship there, but uh, you have a lot of more uh, leeway. You have a lot of more options with cameras, you know, in, in theater that, you know, if you are creating films that have an enormous amount of violence in it, I'm pretty sure that you are going to motivate people to be violent. And I know, and I forgot what film it was, but in that film, there's a depiction of some character that goes into a, a subway station in New York to buy a ticket. In this case, you would have like sort of a plexiglass window with a little hole. He then squirted lighter fluid into it. So this is in the film. And then threw a match. And I guess, you know, so that's, I'm not sure if the guy got killed, but this is really something that happened. Um, Okay, I'm sorry, that's in the film. But then shortly after, someone really did that. They really did that. They, they squirted it and they, and they, I'm not sure if the guy died or something. So I'm, I'm quite interested in how media of any type, because in, in, in many ways, you know, interactive installations, paintings, social media, theater, film, I look at them all the same way, that these are experiences of, of media and they are all promoting a certain type of ethic. And that's what I think I am more concerned with than the actual technology. I use this technology simply because, well, this is what I know. This is what I know how to do. That's, and, and I guess, you know, it's, it's sort of, uh, I mean, my whole development of this type of work was really a series of circumstances and opportunities that developed, I, I didn't try to be, you know, this type of person. Even when I was in, at um, University of Waterloo, which is where I did the psychology degree and the fine arts degree, um, and I sort of had three separate lives in a way, I had no intention of combining them. And But when I was finishing, I thought, well, should I then go for a master's in fine arts? Or, but I thought, well, maybe I should become a psychologist. And then someone said, someone there told me, they said, you know, at MIT, there's a place called the Center for Advanced Visual Studies where artists use technology. And that's where Namjoon Pike had been and a lot of, you know, uh, these sort of pioneers of electronic art. And then I thought, wow, I never never really occurred to me to use electronics as my art medium because at Waterloo, well, the one piece, I had a little sound recording, but that was about it. And then every summer I would go back and work for Nortel or, or for Bell Northern Research. And then when I got to MIT, they just opened, oh, Dawn, yeah, this is, this is what we do here. And I got in, you know, no, no problem. I think because of my background in engineering and at the time, that was a pretty unique place. I didn't know any other school in the world that was doing that. And that, that center, in a way, started like in the 1950s. It really grew out of the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus, these guys were using electronics like Laszlo Mohenaj, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And it was like, God, well, this, I don't know how it happened, but this is where mm -hmm. I should be. Mm -hmm. That's how it ended up. So that's, and again, I, 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 I sort of put everything together because that's just the way it happened. So what about um, the future? What, where, 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 what do you have coming up and, and where, where are your interests going nowadays? Well, the, um, uh, I guess when I first started doing, I guess I didn't mention that, this type of work, it was really... Uh, performance space um, when I had written this software that allowed music to control video and then I worked with George Lewis and then suddenly all these opportunities happened and then I focused on that for about three years and then it was 
uh, you know, George is a pretty famous guy, and people would say, are you George's technician? I said, not exactly. <laughs> so I, I said, is, it, is, this, is this George's software? I said, not exactly. This is my software, and I handled the imagery. But his, you know, reputation was so big, I understood. And I well, I can't do this. Any, I can't work with George anymore. Um, and, uh, and then I thought, well, I'm going to do installations. So... A lot of the stuff with George, the imagery, when I look at it, I'm almost sort of embarrassed, but it was, I was really into surrealism. And, and, then, um, and then with intersection, Vox Populi, which uh, are sort of, the sort of realism, I would say. Mm -hmm. And then in 2015, I got invited to do a uh, architectural projection, or some people call it media facade, where you project onto buildings, and that was in uh, South Korea. And I had, I, I, I lived in, in Seoul for a few years, and and uh, so that's where I made these connections. And I said, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to. I'm not that interested in it. But then they offered me money and stuff, and I said, okay. And then I, they said, well, here's the museum, and what do you want to do? And I, I don't. And then I said, fire. Um, that I want to project fire because I, actually as a child I, I really was a pyromaniac at six years old. I, I really did burn down a lot of trees <laughs> and stuff and, and I, almost, I almost burnt down. I started a fire in my parents' bedroom but I really was a pyromaniac at six years old. And, and so in a way I thought that was, this, this would be very funny. And, and the piece was called... Um, for all the museums that forgot to offer an exhibition to me. <laughs> so you're burning them? Which, and, cause, and, and so the whole museum is burning. And it was pretty aggressive looking because at that point I was playing the fire sort of at real time speed. Re more recently I would slow it down and then it looks more, more elegant. I think a lot of the Koreans didn't, because you, you have to have pretty good understanding of English to understand I'm being incredibly sarcastic mm -hmm. about this. And then, and since then, I, I really got more into, um, um, I guess, what is called substance metaphors, where in, in most cases, if we look at uh, symbolism, of uh, the symbolism is, is more uh, what the apparent when you look at the object. In the case of, of substance metaphor, you're, you're, you're referring not to the substance, as much as a characteristic of the substance. Mm -hmm. So in, in the case of, of uh, water, um, water has the ability to, uh, to reshape itself to any situation. And, and, and I know that water is an important symbol in Taoism. An important aspect of Taoism is just to accommodate, you know, you, you, this is the situation around you, this is the way it is, don't be angry, this is, and that's sort of like water. So I found that, that quite interesting. And then I got more into the symbolism of smoke and mud and, and even plants. And, and so my last big pieces, that's in fact what they're all. So they're, they're, they're much more um, minimalistic. But technologically, in fact, they're much more complicated because dealing with really high resolution and, you know, uh, sometimes, <coughs> you know, these video projectors, you know, we've got know, half a million dollars worth of video projectors. So um, um, that's the direction I've been going the last few years. The pandemic really sort of affected me. I had, I had um, <clears throat> well, I left, I had living in Hong Kong from 2013 to 2017, and then I moved back to Canada. And I thought, okay, now I'm, you know, sort of in what I would call my last chapter. <laughs> And I thought, oh, I'm just going to get a big studio. And I had a nice studio in Montreal. And I had a big 6K projection. And then um, uh, the pandemic happened. And then all my shows were canceled. And, um, and then I sort of shut down. And now just sort of getting back into it again. Um, one of the problems I guess I have with that type of work and it sounds funny is my work is bigger than my reputation. Um, and you know, people often say, oh, you should be showing at the MoMA, you should be showing at the Guggenheim. And I say, gee, I send them a letter, they never reply. <laughs> I mean, because that's, I mean, that, that, that's not 
but that's not that's not how it works. But mm -hmm. in, in general, I, I, I don't exhibit in Canada very much. It's usually um, in Europe or Asia or or the United States because that's so that's just that's just the, the way it happens. So your question is, I don't really know because mm -hmm. I mean I'm not the only artist in this situation. A lot of so is the I, pandemic I'm, created a lot of doubt about what the future is? Yeah, the, a lot, most of my friends actually are are more on the music side, and I have friends like who were you know working for major symphonies. Their careers are just they're wiped out. Mm -hmm. A lot of my friends in Toronto, they're like, you know, like one of my closest friends, well, he's been doing house renovation for the past two years because his music career is, is basically destroyed from it. So I guess I'm not in that, I guess I'm not in a dire situation if, if nothing happens. But um, um, uh, the, 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 my more complicated pieces, like, well, there's another one called Vested, which is really the most complicated. I don't, I don't think I want to do that again. Mm -hmm. There is, you know, on that piece, there's four computers, two moving lights, uh, four cameras, infrared detection, hundreds and hundreds of feet of cabling, which is quite exciting. But to really do that effectively, I would, I would need a group. And sometimes I have had full-time assistants in Berlin and Hong Kong, but right now I don't have a full-time assistant. So uh, I can't exactly answer your question, uh, <laughs> but... Um, but is it, does a telephone and the idea of reducing it down and this to a single phone and with, you know, with existing speaker systems, that this is a kind of practical solution in a way that, that maybe um, represents that bring the scale of pieces down to... I, I guess, I guess, I guess, even to something yeah, that experienced yeah. online. I, I guess it depends. You know, you know, Darren, you've got these six Genelex and uh, uh, subwoofers, but most places are you can drive with any speakers. Mm -hmm. You know, so other places, you know, I guess, I guess my work has been exhibited with at places with you know big budgets and whatever you want uh, to other places that. Um, well, the funny story, one place years ago said, Don, we don't have much of a budget, but you know, you can do whatever you want. I said, yeah, but it's always that way. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a commercial artist. You're not, you're not hiring me to make a, a certain thing. I can, you know, mo as we did here, sort of modify it to, to fit your resources and space. I'm happy to do that, but and no, one, no one tells me. And when I was an academic, this really confused a lot of my colleagues, they couldn't quite understand, like, what do you mean, you, you just make pieces? Because, you know, a lot of the artists that are doing the type of work I do are full-time academics, because mm -hmm. the, I would say the established art world has not really accepted this. Mm -hmm. You know, there's still, you know, the painting, the painting is still God, mm -hmm. basically. That's where the money is made, that's the mm -hmm. people that get the attention. But like myself, you know, I was full-time academic 23 years and I know a lot of other people doing it because if you want to do this type of work, for most cases, that's the only way. There is one exception and that would probably be like Raphael Lozano Hammer, who, you know, in Montreal, he's probably done better than, than any other artist. Because I, I know lots of artists, you know, working with this genre, especially in Europe. And, and New York, but somehow Raphael has, has done better, better than most. I think he's got something like 40, 40 staff of 40 people working wow. for him. You know, so. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think that, that the university has replaced the Arts Council in many ways to, as far as uh, um, patron, patroning uh, experimental work, you know, yeah. uh, I think that That's almost uh, yeah. necessary, yeah. Uh, and it's not only the salaries uh, paying for your time, but also the uh, access to uh, money to purchase equipment or to use equipment that's already there, yeah. Um, yeah. as well as uh, space. You know, having an yeah. institution with big yeah. spaces. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, arts arts council uh, funding for. Uh, organization institution that's funded yeah. only from the arts council it gets you you know maybe a thousand square feet in total yeah, yeah. <laughs> not a thousand yeah, square yeah, feet for yeah. every piece that yeah. they're showing at that yeah. time so so it's uh 
it's it's um, uh, it's. I mean, the only problem with the academic context is the is that is is the lack of public access to the work. Uh, you know, unless there is unless there is a, uh, some outlet for that to happen, um, and things like projection mapping or large festivals and things like that provide that um, context but yeah. but uh, um, but uh, so, but there is a lot of work that doesn't get seen in the academic context yeah. even though it has a lot yeah. of resources yeah. and time put into yeah. making it yeah well even some you know I guess some of the you know the big institutions I guess it's still we don't hear about them as much as the ZKM in Germany which was enormous and then there is Ars Electronica in, in Austria, I, when I talk to people in the art world, most people never heard of these places. Mm -hmm. ZKM, I mean, these people are, and, and art like they're dealing with millions of dollars. This, yeah. These are not small budgets. You know, I've been to Ars Electronica many times. The last time, 2017, where I had a piece there, 80,000 people mm -hmm. over a three day period. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's enormous. But what I found, you know, now this type of department that I was in at MIT is now very, very common mm -hmm. you know, yeah. under different yeah. names. But what I found is that a lot of the, the institutions themselves is not really interested in this type of work. They're sort of, they're trying to push you more to, you know, what's the next killer app? Uh -huh. You know, so they, if you know, so you would probably for some users, they would they would prefer to hire someone that's you know, writing apps for a smartphone than you know multi-channel video sound installation because this type of work there there's really no practical function. It's it's an aesthetic function. It's, it is like it's an artwork. That's what its function is. It's it's not meant to be anything other than that, mm -hmm. which even confuses a lot of people with my work. They don't quite understand why would you, why would you actually do this? Mm -hmm. But it's like going to the cinema, you know, why would you go see a film? Exactly. It's the escape, exactly. it's the... Yeah, but this is new. The cinema has been around for a hundred years. Yeah. This is, they don't, they don't this quite is another way understand. Of story. Like my piece, Vox Populi, once where I was at the BAMP Center, giving a talk and, and a lawyer said, this would be great for teaching people public speaking skills. So it was going to be, a, and I thought, yeah, you're sort of right. She said, you should do it. I said, okay, we're business partners. You handle the business side. I'll handle, mm -hmm. handle the other side. I, I, I don't want to look at it. I don't want to look at it that way. I mean, mm -hmm. this is what I'm, I'm interested in. And, and, and okay, I'll be blunt. I'm basically playing for me. I've been playing my whole life with, you know, painting and, and sculpture and electronics and and I sort of enjoy I enjoy doing that and I don't want to go back to you know designing you know, telecommunications equipment mm -hmm. yeah. cool well I think what maybe to conclude we can play uh, you have a, a video sequence that's uh, yeah so this is a compilation of work I guess uh, it is 30 years yeah but yeah. we'll play the short version I know Okay, sure the three, one, it's, but, oh, it's five minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, just a second, if you bear with me. I have to turn into a technician here for a moment. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, okay, here we go. Oh, ah, okay, you know what? This is the longer one. Actually, I would say this is the biggest
The belief that the right to man come not from the generosity of the state. I want you to rise with me now. Then we will go to the podium. The podium of a new belief and a new system. This installation is a completely dark room, approximately 40 by, by 50 feet. It's a eight-channel audio installation consisting of four pairs of speakers. Each pair of speaker is approximately 40 feet across from each other, facing each other. And what is playing through each pair is the sound of a car approaching and the sound of a car leaving. It's a computer-controlled installation in which each lane is controlled with a random interval. So a car may be coming down one lane and then you may have no cars coming down other lanes or you may have four cars traveling at one time. This is how the installation works if no one is in it. If someone comes in it, however, this is where the interactivity comes into play. If someone is standing in a lane or in front of a speaker, when a car is approaching, the car will screech to a halt. The system has recognized your presence and it will then sit there and idle. Once you leave, it will then continue on its way across the room or technically through the other speaker. And if you remain standing in that lane, though, for approximately eight seconds, another car will come and smash into, into the part car. Unnecessary signage resembles a series of industrial road signs that depict humanity's yes, struggle with morality and, and the human no condition. Sign. Each sign no is sign. accompanied with it's a QR code, code that contains a link to an associated news article. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.